Welcome to Vernal Pools 101. I'm Brett Thielen, Science Director for the Harris Center for Conservation Education, and I'll be your guide for this series of slideshows exploring the exquisite ephemeral world of vernal pools. This slideshow will be focused on what vernal pools are, how you can tell if you found one. We'll also offer short slideshows exploring the ecology and conservation of vernal pools, why they matter, Another one on how to identify the various amphibian egg masses you might find while exploring a vernal pool. And the last one will just be a short um, offering of tips for getting out in the field and finding vernal pools. So let's dig in. We're going to start by exploring how vernal pools fit in into the, a year in the life of the spotted salamander. Spotted salamanders are really striking and charismatic native salamanders. They're about six to eight inches long. They have bright yellow polka dots and they spend 95% of their lives underground. But a few nights each year, they emerge from these underground burrows and migrate across the landscape. This picture is one of my favorites because it shows a salamander who has just emerged from its winter burrows, still caked in mud from underground. These migration nights are often known as big night and they're entirely weather dependent. So what salamanders are looking for in order to make their move are three things. The first is thawed ground. That's because they've spent the entire winter underground below the freeze line. And so they need, in order to get the cue that it's time for spring and time to migrate, the ground must be thawed above them all the way down to the burrows where they've spent the winter. The second is warm nighttime temperatures. As ectotherms or cold-blooded animals, the body temperature of salamanders is dependent on the temperature of their surroundings. And so in order for them to really be warm and spry enough to move, it needs to be about 40 degrees at night because nighttime is when they make their move. These are nocturnal animals. The last of the three conditions is rain. We have a little asterisk there because occasionally if it's rained all day, but stops just before sunset, wet ground will be enough to spur salamanders to move. But in general, what we're looking for are the first warm, rainy nights of the year. In Southwest New Hampshire, this can happen anytime from March through early May. So on these warm, rainy nights, these big nights, spotted salamanders migrate from the underground burrows where they've spent the winter to vernal pools to breed. In general, this migration is less than a quarter mile long, so they're staying fairly close to home. Of course, a quarter mile on tiny legs might not seem so small. When they get to the pools, they do a dance that's known as congressing, where they swim around, swirl all around in the pool. You can see in this photo, there's quite a few salamanders in that pool. Often, males will migrate first and await the females in the vernal pool. After they've congressed, the males will deposit little packets of sperm on the bottom of the vernal pool, typically attached to leaves or twigs and in little clusters. These are called spermatophores, and the white part is what contains their DNA. The clear part is like a little platform, a gelatinous platform to raise them up a bit. After the male salamanders have deposited their spermatophores on the pool bottom, females will select the ones that they want to fertilize their eggs. We don't really know how they choose, although one study in Ithaca, New York, found that 70% of the spotted salamander egg masses had multiple paternity. So the females were choosing spermatophores from multiple males. They may, the males and females may or may not come into contact with one another. Um, the males deposit the spermatophores on the pool bottom, the females go down and then lower their cloacal opening down over the spermatophore, absorb it into their body where it fertilizes the eggs internally. And then she deposits her eggs, um, often attached to a twig or leaf or other vegetation. 
this incredible photo catches a spotted salamander right in the act of depositing her eggs. When the female first deposits her eggs, they're quite small in size, but they quickly absorb water from the vernal pool and grow in size. Spotted salamander eggs are distinctive because they're laid in clusters of up to 150 eggs a piece, and each one is surrounded by um, a firm gelatinous envelope, kind of like jello. In most egg masses, that jello is clear. In some egg masses, it's milky white and opaque. It's just a genetic difference, kind of like hair color. Those eggs hatch in about four to eight weeks, depending on temperature. The warmer it gets, the quicker they develop. And then you have a spotted salamander larva. You can tell this is a salamander larva by those feathery gills at the base of its neck. And as for scale, it's gripping onto something called a fingernail clam, which is another vernal pool dwelling species. Those fingernail clams are, are about half or one third the size of your pinky fingernail. So they're quite tiny, but these little larvae are voracious predators of other invertebrates and insects like mosquito larvae, um, caddisflies, and other invertebrates that live in the vernal pool. They're predators. By the end of the summer, another one to two months, they have metamorphosed. They've lost their external gills and grown lungs. They've also developed um, legs for life on land. And by the end of the summer, they are ready for their new life to disperse away from the vernal pool. It takes spotted salamanders two to five years to reach sexual maturity, to be ready to breed. During that time, they're simply living underground. They're eating all kinds of invertebrates that they find um, in the soil and they're growing. Then um, two to five years later, on a warm, rainy spring night, the cycle begins anew and they head out to breed in the vernal pool. In many cases, they return to the very pool where they themselves were born. And spotted salamanders can live 20 to 30 years if they're not eaten by an owl or hit by a car during that time. So this is a long-lived species with a strong attachment to vernal pools for breeding. So why vernal pools? Why have spotted salamanders, wood frogs, Jefferson salamanders, and other amphibians selected vernal pools as breeding habitat? This next series of photos does a great job of showing what's special about vernal pools. This is a photo from late winter. You can see there's still some snow on the ground. And this vernal pool, like many vernal pools, is essentially a depression in the forest floor that has filled with melting snow and winter and spring rains. In late winter, the pool is icy um, and doesn't have a whole lot of activity happening just yet. The thing to keep an eye on is that downed tree in the middle of the pool. By April, that pool looks like this. You'll notice that the water level has dropped quite a bit. That's because as temperatures warm, evaporation is starting to draw um, water out of the pool and trees are also um, pulling a lot of groundwater out in preparation for leafing out for spring. So you can see that the, the um, flooded part of the pool has shrunk quite a bit, but this is prime time for vernal pools. This is when wood frogs and spotted salamanders and Jefferson salamanders and other critters are making their best use of the pool. Now here's that same vernal pool by late summer. No water left. That's important. couple of other pictures of vernal pools that are a little more local to us here in southwest New Hampshire. Here's a pool in Nelson, New Hampshire on April 30th, full vernal pool season. That same pool in October of that year looks like this. This underscores the importance of going out to look for vernal pools at the right time of year. March, April, May are prime time. Another example of a vernal pool from Hancock, New Hampshire in, on April 20th. Here's that same pool on March 2nd. 
essentially invisible on the landscape under all of that snow. Vernal pools vary widely in size, shape, and appearance. Some have sphagnum moss and blueberry shrubs growing out of them. Others have no vegetation whatsoever. Some might be 10 feet wide and others might be 100 feet wide. There's quite a bit of variability, but they all share a set of characteristics. The first is that they're temporary and seasonal. Eventually they dry up. Some pools dry up every summer. Other pools might dry up only every third or fourth or fifth year during times of drought, but eventually they become dry depressions and their time of highest activity is the spring. For amphibians to breed in them, vernal pools must be surrounded by forest. That's because for the 50 weeks a year that these amphibians are not in the vernal pool, they're living in the woods and under the forest floor. So no woods, no amphibians and no amphibians breeding in the vernal pool. Now there are also really diverse invertebrate communities that exist in vernal pools. They're a little less tied to whether or not there are woods around the pool. So caddisflies and fairy shrimp and fingernail clams may still exist in a vernal pool that no longer is surrounded by woods. But from an amphibian's perspective, you need a forest. Generally, vernal pools are small and shallow. It's rare to find one with more than a few feet deep even in spring. They have no permanent connection to perennial bodies of water like rivers, lakes, or ponds. And all of these together are important because they mean that there are no fish in vernal pools. A place that dries up cannot support a year-round fish population. And that's important because fish eat amphibian eggs and amphibian young. And so the species of amphibians who've adapted to breeding in vernal pools have adapted to a place where there is um, lower risk of predation on their young. Now this doesn't mean that vernal pools are completely risk-free for the amphibians who breed in them. In some ways they've traded in one set of risks, the risk of predation by fish, for another set of risks, the risk of desiccation or drying out. You might remember that amphibians have a remarkable life cycle in which they start off as eggs, often aquatic eggs, they hatch into larvae, aquatic larvae who have gills for breathing underwater and tails for swimming. In vernal pool breeding amphibians, they need to grow lungs and grow legs in order to be ready for life on land before that pool dries out. And in some years, when we have really warm springs or dry springs or drought years, the pools might dry before the young amphibians are ready for life on land and they might not make it that year. The adaptation for this is that vernal pool breeding species return year after year. Spotted salamanders can live up to 30 years, returning year after year to breed in their pools. So one dry year um, isn't catastrophic for them. They've adapted. So how do you know if you have a vernal pool? You might have found a wicked big puddle in your woods, but is it a vernal pool? Vernal pools are defined physically and biologically. Both sets of factors have to be present in order for something to qualify as a vernal pool. So the physical qualification is that the pool dries up eventually. You might have to go back in late summer or fall to confirm this. The biological factor is that there's evidence of breeding by what are known as obligate species. These are species who are dependent upon vernal pool for their survival. Obligate species are species who require vernal pool for the long-term survival of the species. They're also known as primary or indicator species. And in our part of New Hampshire, there are four primary species, fairy shrimp, wood frogs, spotted salamanders, and Jefferson complex salamanders. We'll talk more about each one in the coming slides. There are also many other species who use vernal pools in one way or another for shelter or for foraging but don't require them for their long-term survival. These are also known as secondary species, and they include things like dragonflies and caddisflies and spotted turtles who forage in vernal pools in the spring. But if you have only secondary species and none of the primary species, it's not technically considered a vernal pool. So the first species we'll talk about is the wood frog. 
These frogs are brown or orangish in color. They have a dark brown mask behind each eye, and they're um, about half the size of the palm of your hand for scale. They are one of our earliest spring migrants. They're extremely cold tolerant, and in fact, they spend the winter frozen just a few inches below the forest floor. Remarkable adaptation. Up to 65% of the water in their body freezes solid, their heart stops beating, their lungs stop breathing, and they just wait in suspended animation um, for spring to arrive when they thaw out and hop back to life. And they might be the first clue that you are nearing a vernal pool because when the males get to a vernal pool on warm, um, sunny afternoons as well as into the night, they sing. It's called chorusing and they are singing in great numbers um, as part of their breeding and courtship. And they've got a very distinctive sound. Uh, it only typically lasts for a few weeks each spring. It's one of the very first sound of spring, and it sounds like this. It's not ducks, it's wood frogs. Our second Obligate species, we've already talked about a fair bit, the spotted salamander, six to eight inches long, gray in color with bright yellow polka dots, really hard to mistake them for anything else. They are quiet critters. Salamanders communicate primarily through smell, not through sound, and so you won't hear them singing. You'll just have to look for them at night with a flashlight. In some vernal pools in our region, we have a related salamander, the Jefferson salamander, or the blue spotted salamander, or the Jefferson blue spotted salamander complex. These are gray to brown salamanders with light blue or sometimes bright blue flecking or spots all around their bodies. And the reason they've got such a long and complicated name is because Jefferson salamanders and blue spotted salamanders frequently hybridize in places where their ranges overlap. And you can't tell from looking at them which one they are. You have to do genetic testing. So when we find Jefferson or blue spotted salamanders, we assume that we've got the hybrid. Um, and the way to tell them from a spotted salamander is that the spotted salamander has bright yellow polka dots. And the Jefferson and blue spotted salamanders have either pale blue flecking or bright blue spots, quite different. These are much less common. They are only found in certain places in our region and are considered a species of special concern in the state of New Hampshire. Our fourth obligate species is also fairly uncommon. I'd say we have them in about 10% of the known vernal pools here in the Monadnock region, but when you find them, it feels a lot like magic. They're called fairy shrimp. They got that name because they seem to appear as if by magic like fairies do in pools each spring, sometimes even under the ice before the pool has fully thawed. They are small crustaceans related to the sea monkeys you may have raised as a kid, orange or green in color, slightly more than an inch long, and they glide around quite gracefully through the water column. They're very particular in that they will not hatch in a given year if their pool has not dried completely and refilled and if it has not frozen and then thawed. So they're actually a species that occurs out in desert ecosystems where they can wait out long, long dry periods as eggs. Another glimpse of fairy shrimp. This one is a male. You can tell because on his head, he's got those claspers that he uses to grab onto females during courtship and breeding. One mass glimpse of fairy shrimp here. They move quite gracefully through the water. They use those gills for propulsion through the water. They're, very, they're mesmerizing swimmers, if you can catch a glimpse of them. Also want to mention something that is um, people often mistake for fairy shrimp, um, but that are definitely not fairy shrimp. You'll notice in the fairy shrimp pictures that they were orange or green in color that they had all those gills which enabled them to kind of swim gracefully on their backs. The species in front of us now is black in color, quite spastic in movement. It is not graceful at all and it is present in every vernal pool. 
that is the mosquito larvae. So just uh, something to look out for um, while searching for fairy shrimp as you're out and about. That wraps up our first installment of Vernal Pools 101. I will include some links to videos that show fairy shrimp swimming and spotted salamanders congressing down below. Happy to answer any questions you might have by email to thielen at harriscenter.org. And stay tuned for more on egg mass identification, why vernal pools matter, and a few tips and tricks for finding vernal pools out on your own.